In January of 1902, to prepare for battles in cold and mountainous climates, the Japanese Imperial Army sent 210 men on a training exercise across the Hakoda Mountains in the middle of winter. This would go on to be the single deadliest mountaineering disaster in all of recorded history. This is the story of the Hakoda Mountains disaster. At the turn of the 20th century, tensions were rising between the Japanese Emperor and the Russian Tsar, and war was seeming more and more likely between the two nations. Throughout history, Russia has been known for its ability to fight effectively in the cold, and in fact, it's often seemed as though the colder it is, the fiercer they could be. This was something that the Japanese High Command was worried about. The first Sino-Japanese War had just ended in 1895, during which the Japanese faced significant problems fighting in cold and mountainous terrain in Korea. Not only did it make the battles difficult, but it was a logistical nightmare. If war were to break out again, they expected to face similar conditions on their northern shores or even across the sea. A scenario that was thought of as particularly likely was the shelling of the northern coast of Honshu, the largest of the Japanese islands. In this scenario, all of the roads and railways along the coast would be destroyed and make travel inland necessary. The only problem is that just south of the north coast of Honshu is a mountain range known as the Hokoda Mountains. These are a series of active volcanoes, and some are as high as over 5,000 feet or 1,500 meters. They're also known to get a significant amount of snowfall, which would make travel across them even more difficult, not to mention the fact that temperatures 30 degrees below freezing were not unheard of. So because of this, the Japanese High Command came up with a plan. They would train some specialist units to secure route across the mountain range in the winter. This was seen as the perfect training exercise for a few reasons. First, this might emulate the exact scenario that could occur if war broke out. Second, troops could establish a path through the mountains so there was no guesswork later on. And finally, these units would not only get practice in the cold mountains, but they'd also be able to inform the rest of the army on the logistics of travel in those conditions. So next, two regiments were chosen to perform the practice missions. First was the 31st Regiment that would travel 21 miles from Hirosaki to Aomori. The other was the 5th Regiment. These were two groups that were already stationed in the north, and so they were more used to dealing with the cold already. The man chosen to lead the 5th Regiment was Captain Bunkichi Kanari. Bunkichi had joined the Japanese Imperial Army shortly after the First Sino-Japanese War, and it was apparent pretty quickly that he was a good leader. He quickly rose to the ranks until eventually getting promoted to captain. He also happened to make a good choice for this exercise because he was used to the cold mountainous terrain in his home prefecture. Bunkichi's job would be to lead his group from Aomori to the east coast 44 miles away and through the Hakoda Mountains. 210 men were then selected from the 5th Regiment, and the exercise was planned for the middle of January. As a weird aside, the second in command to Bunkichi was actually his superior, Major Shin Yamaguchi. The Major was an extremely well-educated officer, and he spoke English and French and became a Major while fighting in the Japanese Sino War. On top of that, he'd faced the coal before and the mountains, so his job in the exercise was to plan their route and get them to each checkpoint. It's not entirely clear why the Major wasn't in charge instead of Bunkichi, but in any case, when the day of the operation came, Bunkichi led his men out at just before 7am on January 23rd. The first of many problems they'd soon encounter was that even though these soldiers were stationed in a northern prefecture, not many of them had experience crossing the mountains. In fact, some of them had never even seen snow before since they weren't all necessarily from that area. It's just where they were sent to be stationed. This worried Bunkichi enough that he thought about letting a local villager who knew the region well guide them. But Major Yamaguchi was confident that his military training and map and compass were enough, so they ended up leaving the guide behind. The first day was supposed to be a short walk from Aomori to some hot springs roughly 11 miles away. Bunkichi thought that the only tricky part, if any, would be climbing over a 2400 foot mountain along the way. In fact, they didn't have much trouble until they reached the snow in a high pass. During the next half mile walk from there to another pass though, the temperatures began to drop and the snow got deeper. Almost immediately, the question their mission was investigating had an answer, which was that moving heavy gear through deep snow is extremely difficult. All their gear had been loaded onto a sled, and this included all their food, heating and cooking equipment, and anything they might need to build shelters or move snow. Soldiers then took turns pulling this sled. As they made their way higher and the snow became deeper, dragging it became more and more difficult. This is partly due to the thick snow, and partly because everything was becoming frozen solid. For a moment, because of how difficult things got so rapidly, Bunkichi even wondered if they should turn back. But he realized they weren't out there to find out if moving men and equipment through the cold was difficult. They were there to find out if it was possible. 
These were exactly the conditions they might expect in the Korean mountains or if the Russians tried to invade. So, despite protests from some of the soldiers, everyone was ordered to keep going. By 4 p.m., the troops managed to cover just over a mile from the high pass to reach the bottom of the mountain. This meant the hot springs were just two and a half miles away if they could get up and over, but Bunkichi could tell that the volcano was going to be a challenge. It was already covered in deep snow, and getting to the top with the sled would be even more difficult. As they started up the mountain, it was challenging enough for the troops who only carried their own gear. For the ones dragging the sled, it was almost impossible. Soon, the sled party was an hour behind the main body of soldiers and needed help to catch up. Bunkichi then sent his 2nd and 3rd platoons back down the mountain to help them pull, and at the same time, he sent 15 men to scout ahead and find the trail to the hot springs to see if the sled could even be pulled down it. The 88 extra men sent to help the sled pullers managed to get the equipment up and over the mountain, but not much further. It didn't help that they were also all starving, but all their food was frozen solid and couldn't be eaten. By then as well, it was clear to Bunkichi that the sled was a lost cause, so at 6pm he gave the order for all the gear to be pulled off of it and for each soldier to carry as much gear as they could. Some of the items they took with them were heavy, like copper cooking pots, and Bunkichi knew it wasn't an ideal solution, but there wasn't much else they could do. So, with everything on their backs, they kept moving again and started down the mountain. About two hours after abandoning the sled, the soldiers found themselves in a forest just a mile from the hot springs. A little earlier, they'd actually even bumped into the advance party Bunkichi had sent to find the trail. Because these men weren't experienced in that sort of terrain, they'd gotten lost, and it was only by luck they bumped into the rest of the soldiers. At that point, it was well below freezing, and the winds were whipping up the snow, causing whiteout conditions. This meant finding the trail to the hot spring was almost impossible. They could barely see their hands in front of their faces, let alone any landmarks. So, instead of risking getting lost, like his advance party had, they then dug a trench into the snow and tried to get any rest they could. Unfortunately, this would go on to be a brutally cold night, where almost no one could sleep. Some troops had salvaged a little charcoal from the sled and lit small fires, but it wasn't enough to keep all 210 men warm. After only a few hours, the situation was getting so bad that Bunkichi realized that if they stayed there much longer, they might not even make it through the night. Even worse though was that he wasn't entirely sure where they were. The blizzard showed no signs of slowing down and the map and compass were useless without any way of spotting a peak or a river for reference. Ultimately, he decided that following the tracks they had made the previous day was the best and maybe only option. So at 2am, he decided to turn his men back around, climb back up over the mountain, and head back to Aomori less than 24 hours after they'd begun their mission. Unfortunately for the soldiers, it ended up being just as hard to find the way back up the mountain as it might have been to find the trail to the hot springs. The blizzard had essentially erased all of their tracks and visibility in the storm was almost non-existent. Just an hour into their trek, Bunkichi and his men found themselves lost in a gorge with steep cliffs on either side. They were sure that following the valley would take them the wrong way, so in the dark, with a blizzard raging all around them and temperatures well below freezing, they decided to try and climb the cliffs. This is where the first men were lost. In the darkness, nobody saw their comrades fall, but they could hear them screaming as they lost their grip and plummeted to the rocks below. Trying to find the men who fell and give them medical help was impossible too, because the soldiers couldn't see a thing. Backtracking down the sheer cliffs in the pitch darkness was maybe even more dangerous, so anyone who didn't die in the fall couldn't be rescued. It was better to stay as close to the others as possible and climb slowly and carefully. Those who made it up the cliffs continued the treacherous walk back until Major Yamaguchi suddenly ordered everyone to stop. At about 8am, one of the lower ranking officers, Sergeant Major Sato, convinced Major Yamaguchi that he knew where the trail leading to the hot springs was. With this new revelation, the Major decided to turn the troops around and give temporary command to Sergeant Sato, hoping he could lead them to safety. After a short walk in this new direction, they found themselves on the banks of a river, nowhere near any trail. Sergeant Sato was wrong about where he thought the trail was, meaning they had travelled all that extra distance for nothing. In the chaos of this revelation, one of the officers and another soldier tried to keep going by crossing the river, but immediately they were caught in the current and swept away to the shock and horror of everyone else. This was a breaking point for many of the soldiers. They were already freezing and hungry, and they'd heard their friends falling around them the night before, and now they just witnessed two more men get swept away in the river. On top of all of that, the glimmer of hope they'd been given by Sergeant Sato was completely gone. Bunkichi tried to calm things down, but he couldn't. He knew that they had to backtrack once again, which meant climbing the cliffs again, where more men would for sure fall off. But without any other options, they turned around and trudged on and then climbed the cliffs again and lost even more soldiers. After making it over again, they had to find somewhere to camp to find some shelter from the blizzard. Unfortunately by then as well, all of the men carrying the digging equipment had disappeared either from the first or second time climbing the cliffs. 
So instead, after scouting ahead, Bunkichi found a slight depression in the mountainside that offered a little bit of shelter from the wind. As if things couldn't get any worse, the brutal cold from the night before wasn't as cold as it was going to get. The second night was in fact the coldest night ever recorded in Japan. The temperature in the mountains dropped to negative 41 degrees Celsius or negative 41.8 Fahrenheit. And without adequate shelter, many of the soldiers froze to death. When Bunkichi woke them up early the following day, 40 soldiers had either died from exposure or had been lost on the cliffs the day before. At 3 a.m. on January 25th, so early on day two since they started, Bunkichi and his remaining troops set off once again, trying to find their way back to the mountain. At this point, almost everyone was suffering from some degree of frostbite and many were in the early stages of hypothermia. Their compass was also frozen and the map they had wasn't much use because they still didn't know where they were. So they were sort of just following their instincts, they couldn't really do much else. Bunkichi thought he was heading in the right direction, at least roughly, but it was impossible to be sure. He just hoped that they would eventually stumble back on the mountain that they needed to cross to head back down to safety. So they marched and marched, but eventually Bunkichi realized he could be anywhere. Every hillside looked like the last, every river was the same, every forest was just more trees. Major Yamaguchi wasn't how much either, he didn't know where they were even with his map, compass and military training. They thought back to when they turned down the help of the local man and thought how they might be sitting in a nice hot spring sipping sake instead of the brutal march they were on, but unfortunately they hadn't and things were only getting worse for the troops. Many of them were entering the later stages of hypothermia as they marched on and some began paradoxically undressing. This is when the extreme cold tricks the body into thinking it's burning up. Soon, many of them were complaining about the heat and stripping off their clothes and some even jumped into a nearby river. Obviously, the soldiers who did this didn't come back afterward. Bunkichi decided it was time to let his troops know that he was lost, and despite his best efforts, he was clueless about where to go next. He then said to them, from that moment, they were dismissed and they had to find their own way back to Al Mori. This was another breaking point for many of the soldiers. Some began walking toward the trees, yelling that they'd cut them down to create a raft and go home by following the river. Others shouted about heading back down toward the cliff, convinced they'd be back in Almori if they just reached the bottom and followed the gorge along. This splintered the group further as many soldiers wandered off to try to save themselves, thinking they knew a better way than their failed leadership. By then as well, between the paradoxical undressing and delirium, around 30 more soldiers had passed away. While all of this was happening, one of the other captains, a man named Captain Qureshi, had managed to stay relatively calm and collected. As they had marched earlier that day, he'd selected 15 of the most resilient officers and a platoon of soldiers that he thought would likely survive, just given how their condition seemed. He also thought he knew a way back to the mountain, so on Bunkichi's order that it was every man for himself, he took his small group and set off toward the direction he thought was correct. Unfortunately, however strong Captain Qureshi thought his small group was, the cold was getting to them as well. As they marched on, one of these soldiers supposedly mistook a swinging branch in a tree up ahead for a rescue team. This delusion then started to spread to others, and other troops began to see what he had. Many of them started to scream in excitement and shouted that it was true, but this was then quickly followed by the realization that it wasn't that at all, and it further eroded what little spirit they had. Captain Qureshi wasn't going to allow his resilient group to fall apart though, so he ordered one of the soldiers to blow as hard as possible on his trumpet whenever panic set in. This sudden noise seemed to bring the men around, at least temporarily, and every now and then when panic set in, the soldier blew his trumpet. At some point during the march, the captain sent some of his strongest soldiers out ahead as a scouting party, and miraculously, at 11.30am, two of them returned with good news. They found the trail home, and they were sure of it, so once again, they all set off toward where they thought the mountain was and through the brutal cold. This was actually the correct trail, but by then, for many of them, it just didn't matter. As they continued, the two men who had scouted ahead died in each other's arms, trying to stay warm. Shortly after, the army surgeon and chief nurse succumbed to hypothermia after exhausting themselves and trying to take care of other soldiers. Even the soldier whose trumpet blast had helped keep the group focused was frozen with his trumpet by his side and his frozen lips still attached. Incredibly, Captain Qureshi wasn't the only person who had managed to find the trail back. Later that day, Bunkichi led himself, Major Yamaguchi, and other troops who decided to stick with them to the mountain. The two parties met and camped in a forest just north of the mountain, and thankfully, the weather broke a little. At the same time, although it wasn't as cold as it had been, temperatures were still well below freezing. The only way they could get any heat was by burning the rucksacks of anyone who didn't make it, but this still wasn't enough to stop even more soldiers from freezing overnight. By dawn on January 26, only around 60 soldiers were left from the original 210. Major Yamaguchi had also fallen unconscious through the night, so Bunkichi ordered some of the soldiers to carry him along with them. 
Bunkichi then took a small group of officers ahead, climbing to higher ground so they could find the route and direct everyone else. Meanwhile, Captain Kureishi stayed below to keep the other soldiers on course, but everyone was so weak that they couldn't go far before needing rest. After a long day of marching again, that evening, they huddled together in a circle, sharing what little body heat they still had. But again, some people were already too far gone. The next day, they woke up to find that only 30 soldiers were left from the day before. Bunkichi then got them together and set off early in the morning. Eventually, they found themselves at a fork in the trail, but they didn't know which direction led them to safety. After some deliberation, the decision was made to split into two groups so that if one party found the way back, they could send people back for the other party. Captain Kureishi and Major Yamaguchi, who had recovered by then, took some troops one way and Bunkichi led everyone else the other. Unfortunately, Captain Kureishi's trail led him the wrong way back and toward the river that those two soldiers had been swept away in. What made it worse was that they got caught in another blizzard en route. For many, this was all their body could take, and they fell as they marched and never got up. Upon reaching the river as well and realizing they had gone the wrong way, Captain Kureishi decided that the best thing they could do was stop. The rescue party had to be looking for them by then, so staying put seemed like a sensible option. Many of his party unfortunately didn't feel the same way and couldn't wait for rescue. Some even decided to keep going by crossing the river, but not a single one of these soldiers successfully made it across. Even Sergeant Sato, the man who was convinced he knew the route days early, was convinced he could survive the river where others hadn't. But just like the others, he never made it across. At the same time all of this was happening, Bunkichi's group was heading in the right direction. But despite being close to salvation, every step was still a monumental struggle. It seemed like with every footfall, somebody else collapsed into the snow and didn't get up again. Soon, only just two were left, Bunkichi himself and another officer, Corporal Goto. Eventually, they thought they could see a town in the distance, and they were right. It was Tamojino on the outskirts of Aomori. In complete exhaustion, Bunkichi took one look at the lights ahead and then collapsed the ground. He then looked at the corporal and gave one last order. He said, go to Tamojino and ask the local residents to contact the regiment. As far as anyone knows, these were his last words. A few hours later, a rescue team found the corporal standing motionless in the snow. He had been walking for hours, and by then, his energy was completely gone. When they found him, he was actually still alive, but literally frozen in place. He was described by the rescue team as looking like a statue emerging from the snow. And when they finally found the corporal, the full gravity of the situation started to be realized. There had actually been concern already about the members of the 5th Regiment ever since they hadn't shown up when they were supposed to on January the 4th, so just one day after they left. The following day, on January 25th, they even made food ready for them to return, assuming they'd simply been delayed because of the bad weather the day before. Finally, when they still hadn't shown up by 10pm, they contacted the local police to see if there was any sign of any soldiers anywhere. This was when the rescue mission was officially launched, knowing that something terrible had happened to the mission if not a single soldier had shown up. The eventual full rescue involved over 10,000 people, including the rest of the Aomori Regiment and the Hirosaki Regiment. First, they attempted to estimate the route where Bunkichi might have led his troops. Then they traveled carrying sticks in a line that was 30 people wide. As they walked, they'd stab these long sticks into the newly fallen snow, and if they felt something strange, they'd stop and dig to see if it was a soldier who was buried. The rescue team would then go out to do this for six hours a day, trying every route they could think of. They also used hunting dogs provided by a local tribe, and the dogs found quite a few missing troops, but none were alive. The rescue team also quickly realized that many of the bodies were also in the rivers, so they built sandbars to temporarily dam the water and stop anyone from floating away. Two days after the search was launched, Captain Kureishi was found in a cave on the cliff. Their survivors of his party had walked back there to find shelter from the blizzards. Major Yamaguchi was also rescued with them, but he died on February 2nd while still recovering in the hospital. The official reason for his death was ruled as cardiac arrest, but there are also rumors that the shame of the disaster was too much for him to handle. Next, the body of Captain Bunkichi Kanari was discovered the following day, only a few miles from the town he collapsed in view of. The day after that, another 36 were found on the trail between the fork the two captains had found. Another couple of days later, on January 1st, miraculously, two more soldiers were found alive in a charcoal mining shack. They were taken to the hospital, but only one survived. Around this hut as well were 16 more troops who weren't so lucky. Not far from the hut, in the region's forest, dozens more were uncovered from the frozen snow. In the end, only 11 of the total 210 that set off survived. And for those that did survive, things were still bleak. Because of the frostbite, eight of them had to have their arms and legs amputated, and another lost three fingers. Later, an investigation into the disaster revealed a few reasons for the events that occurred. 
The first was obviously the weather. January 5th of that year was the coldest temperature ever recorded in Japan, and this was only further amplified by the clothing they had for the mission. Back then, a winter uniform was a wool coat, a service cap, a uniform made from cotton flannel, cotton gloves, and long snow boots if you were an officer. If you weren't an officer, you didn't even get that. Some of the officers had bought better clothes for the exercise, and some of these were the men who were ultimately found alive. Like for example, Captain Kureishi bought a set of rubber boots in Tokyo earlier that year, and it's believed that's the reason his feet were safe from frostbite. In addition to their poor clothing, it's clear that the group had issues with leadership. Even though Bunkichi was supposed to be in command, his number two was a major who outranked him, and most of his colleagues were of equal rank. More than once, Bunkichi's decisions were questioned. Like when Major Yamaguchi decided to listen to Sergeant Sato and led them back the way they had already come, adding precious time to their already desperate situation. In the end, historically bad weather, poor planning, and poor leadership resulted in one of the worst mountaineering disasters in history. Today, close to where the tragedy unfolded is a memorial statue of the real-life statue Corporal Goto, standing motionless, alone, and hoping for rescue. And on February 6th, 1904, Russia and Japan went to war. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have a story suggestion, feel free to send it to me by the email found in the description, and hopefully I will see you in the next one.